Roy. I'm the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. For those of you who are not familiar with the Woodrow Wilson Center, we were created by Congress in the 1968 as a living memorial to the only American president who uh, had a doctorate. Uh, and our goal is to try to bring together the world of scholarship and public policy. We have a fascinating subject today, the changing contours of civil society in China, the growth of grassroots NGOs and public advocacy. During the two periods that I served as a government, American government official in China in the 70s and the 90s, uh, this would have been an, a topic on which we would have only wasted time. There was nothing useful to discuss. Uh, during the 70s, basically there wasn't civil society as we know it in China at that time. During the, the first half of the 1990s when I was there, we were just beginning to see the glimmerings of the emergence of government organized uh, non-governmental organizations, which were essentially just instruments of government policy. So again, they did not play the role that we normally associate uh, with civil society and non-governmental organizations. That situation has changed very significantly, and it's continuing to change very rapidly. One of the interesting things about this topic is we're talking essentially about advocacy groups. And advocacy means <coughs> influence. And there's some very interesting discussion in the material, if you go to the websites and look at it, about the difference between advocacy and influence. Some people are concerned, for example, that the emergence of the blogosphere is actually producing the opposite of real influence. Instead of getting out there and working hard to influence people, people are posting their views and thinking that that takes care of the issue. But nevertheless, the fact is that the blogosphere in China has become an important force. So one of the interesting things about Dr. Xiao's presentation is that what works in one country in terms of advocacy and influence may not work in another country. And therefore, it's very important to track the experience of what is going on in China and to try to understand what is working there and what is not working there. And this may change from this year to next. Uh, certainly, the, there are at least two factors, I think, that significantly influenced this. One was the emergence of the HIV, uh, tainted blood, uh, situation, and the other was the major earthquake in Sichuan in 2008, when the government began to realize that the government itself couldn't deal with all of the consequences on its own, and it began to recognize that civil society organizations uh, could be helpful in this respect, and this is one of the factors that has led to the changing domestic picture in China. So I think we're very fortunate to have Dr. Xie here to address this question. He is the uh, director and editor of the China Development uh, Brief, and for those interested in civil society development in China, this is truly must reading. And he has, for nearly 10 years, uh, been devoting his time to studying civil society in China and tracking uh, the changes that are taking place. So I think we're very fortunate to have you here, Dr. Xie. Let me turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I think that was a really good, yeah, very good introduction in, um, to, to my talk because, as, as you said, I think there, are, there, there have been a lot of changes recently. And I was fortunate enough to come two years ago and speak here. Uh, and I want to thank the, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center for, again, having me the second time around. Um, but the first time I came to talk was about the rise of private foundations. Uh, so it was uh, about philanthropy and civil society and whether the rise of private foundations will provide a new source of funding for uh, NGOs and nonprofits in, in China. And so in a way, this is like an ex sort of a part two, uh, you know, my part two of, my, uh, of my, um, my discussion of civil society. This is a discussion of grassroots NGOs and, uh, and advocacy. 
And uh, I first want to thank everybody for making the trip out here. I know it's uh, a, like a sauna out there, and uh, I really appreciate you making the trip to, to listen to this, um, to this talk. I'm fortunate to come here because every summer we usually come back to the U.S., mostly for family reasons. And I try to make a point when I do come back to try to give some talks to promote what we're doing because our organization, China Development Brief, doesn't really have the resources to, um, to send people out and promote our, our work uh, overseas. But the reason that I started uh, the China Development Brief English, the English side of this, um, this organization, was to better inform the international community about all these changes that have been going on in the civil society community, in the ph philanthropic community. Uh, Ambassador uh, Roy mentions, I think, uh, the, the earthquake in 2008 and also the HIV blood scandals in the 1990s. Uh, and I could add to that 2011, so two years ago, was a really big year because there were a lot of scandals regarding a lot of the uh, foundations with government ties like the Red Chinese Red Cross, uh, the China Charity Federation, uh, and so forth. And so these scandals really had an impact on the way that people perceived these government-organized NGOs and uh, sort of led to greater or m less credibility for these organizations. So in, there was a, a recent earthquake, in, again, in Sichuan a couple of months ago. And in that recent earthquake, a lot of people were blogging about the Chinese Red Cross and saying, you know, something like they were using the Chinese word guin, which is like to kind of go away. You know, they were saying, look, you shouldn't give to the Chinese Red Cross. So actually, a lot of the donations in that last earthquake went to the One Foundation. The One Foundation is one of those uh, private, well, it used to be a private foundation. It was started by a citizen named Jet Li, who, as many of you know, is a martial arts action figure. So, um, and, uh, but he, one, the One Foundation actually got a lot of the funding, a lot of the donations during that period. So we're seeing interesting changes in the way that people perceive um, foundations and NGOs and nonprofits in China. By the way, I want to say that uh, I was, I have to put my cap on as, as the speaker now, I was, I was the salesman out there, but I do have a few copies uh, that I brought all the way from Ch uh, Beijing of the NGO directory and the advocacy report uh, that I'll be talking about today. So those are available on, uh, for, they're available for sale outside, uh, and I'll be out there again after the talk to, uh, if anybody wants to buy any copies. But um, I just want to say that you can also buy these online. I mean, the reason I'm doing these talks is to sort of get the word out about these, um, these publications, because they're not published officially. We weren't, unfortunately, able to publish it through an official press because of various restrictions on uh, publishing directories. So uh, that means we have to do our own distribution, and so that meant I had to log, uh, bring all these directories from Beijing. Uh, but they are available online. If you want to order them online, you can, but we charge uh, an extra $15 in shipping. So if you buy it here, you save the $15. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to make that point. Anyway, the, um, the title of my talk is called The Changing Contours of China's Civil Society the growth of grassroots NGOs and public advocacy. There's really two parts to my talk. One is about grassroots NGOs and to highlight the NGO directory that we made. The other part is about advocacy and the growth of advocacy because, again, as Ambassador Roy said, I mean, advocacy has been, a, for a long time, been an underdeveloped area in China uh, among NGOs. Most NGOs have been mostly service provision NGOs. But, of course, you know, there's the question of, um, of who speaks for these communities. Uh, and for a long time, you know, NGOs have been reluctant to speak for these communities uh, through these kinds of advocacy campaigns or advocacy um, you know, uh, activities. So we're beginning to see a change uh, in that. I just wanted to give credit, first of all, to uh, our small staff at China Development Brief because they're the ones who really made these reports and these directories possible. And here um, in March of this year, after we published both of these reports, we held, um, you, can't you can kind of see behind there, the State of Chinese Civil Society Forum, which we held in the Beijing American Center, I think which is part of the, um, the U.S. Embassy. But uh, that, that forum attracted uh, about 130 people, and um, 
it was again to promote the publications that we have been uh, putting out. Um, the so the staff here are most those are most of the the person in the middle Gong Rei is the uh, the managing director. The person to my to my left is Fu Tao, who is one of the founders of China Development Brief and was the longtime editor, who is now based in Chengdu. And then the new editor is Liu Haiying, who is second to the uh, second to the left. Um, and then Guo Ting is, sta is another staff writer. She's to the far left. Uh, and so you know these are the staff. I think we have now f eight full-time staff at China Development Brief who do all this reporting. We're located near the center of the city. If anybody knows Beijing, we're located just to the northeast of Jingshan Park in some hutongs there. Um, so this is our courtyard office, our modest courtyard office. And we've started a kind of civil society learning space uh, for people who want to come through and learn about civil society. And I've, we've received some university groups, um, and we've given them talks and introductions to the history of China Development Brief and, and to different parts of the civil society sector in China. So uh, I did want to make a note of that. Just to kind of bring together the two parts of my talk, right, grassroots NGOs and public advocacy and how they're related, um, and how, they're re you know, how they figure in in terms of the mapping of civil society in China. I kind of created this diagram um, you know, you have NGOs in the middle, um, but then on the periphery, you have all these individuals. Some of these individuals are working separately and alone. Some are working in collaboration with NGOs. Some of these individuals have founded their own NGOs, and then they work in other ca in other activities as individuals. But you know, there there's not a clear relationship. But you know, I think for many of these people. They are somehow involved in the NGO uh, world. So uh, you have people like Dai Qing, who is an environmental journalist, uh, and of course Cheng Guangcheng, who's been in the, <laughs> the media recently, uh, one of the lawyer, uh, kind of a, a self-practicing lawyer. Uh, academics, uh, celebrities like Jet Li in the lower right-hand corner, uh, former government officials and government officials like Wang Zhenyao, who left the Ministry of Civil Affairs to start to work to head the, um, the China Philanthropy Research Institute at uh, Beijing Normal University, and you know I mean people don't think of government officials as being part of civil society, but I think we should consider them that if they're acting in a role of an individual working on behalf of civil society, and I think they can sometimes make a important uh, impact. Ai Weiwei is uh, I guess representative of some of the artists that work in this sector, although generally they don't tend to work with NGOs. Uh, so anyway, this is just some of the uh, kind of constellation of some of the individuals uh, involved in the civil society sector. So let me just talk about the, um, the directory first. Uh, so this is, I would say, the first, um, the first public directory of what we would call the, m the grassroots or more the independent NGOs in China. Uh, there have been a fairly long history of direct NGO directories. I think the earliest NGO directory I found was in 1998. Uh, there was a directory of women NGOs. And it's interesting, if you look through that directory, all the, uh, almost all the organizations in that directory are women's federations, Fulian, right? So, and the women's federations are all mass organizations. And there's you know, women's federations at the national level, at the provincial level, at the county level. So this directory is just full of women's federations. So I think it's quite a change now that we've gone from a directory that contains mass organizations, which are essentially party-created organizations, to a directory where there are no uh, government uh, NGOs. They're all grassroots independent NGOs. And that's really, I think, the the value of this particular directory and the distinctiveness of this directory. Um, let me just say a little bit about why we made this directory. Uh, again, it was to really raise awareness about and attract more support for China's grassroots public benefit NGOs. I mean, there's been a lot of assistance, international assistance going to China, 
But the large portion of that assistance, the lion's share, has gone to the government, it's gone to universities, to research institutes, and to government-run NGOs. So it's gone to the state sector, and very little of it has really gotten to the more independent sector. Um, so we wanted to raise awareness about that and, and uh, hope that people use this directory to find partners, to find uh, grantees in the NGO sector. Uh, like I said, previous directories didn't really make a distinction between gongos and grassroots NGOs or even Chinese NGOs and international NGOs. They're all kind of mixed together. So we thought it would be really useful if we just like put all the, so, you know, put all these grassroots NGOs into one, into one book. So in a way, it's it's yeah, it's kind of like, you know, an attempt at advocating for this group of grassroots NGOs. What do I mean by grassroots NGOs? I mean grassroots bottom-up organizations that are established by citizens uh, and differ from gongos or go government organized NGOs which are top-down NGOs with government background. Um, and like other parts of China's civil society sector, these grassroots NGOs are private, voluntary, self-governing, nonprofit, and mission-driven. So this is a group of NGOs that really conforms most closely to the international definition of a civil society organization. Um, <clears throat> how did we make this directory? This directory took uh, over a year to make. Um, it started with um, some funding from the U.S. Embassy, uh, and we um, basically started with a list of uh, grassroots NGOs that we knew about, that we had reported on over the last 10 to 12 years. And then we reached out to about nine regional partners for recommendations about NGOs in their region. Uh, we had a list of criteria that these NGOs had to meet. So they had to be like grassroots public interest groups. Uh, so this meant that we, you know, we wanted to, we didn't want to consider there were um, these other sort of trade associations or professional associations which worked mostly on behalf of their own members. Um, because there's a lot of those as well. Uh, they also had to be established for at least two years. So they had to have some kind of track record. Uh, they had to be active, they had to have ongoing programs, and they had to be recognized by others. There had to be some kind of external influence, uh, or re external recognition uh, by our, our regional partners, who are essentially like umbrella organizations for, uh, regional umbrella organizations for, for NGOs. Just to provide some context, I mean, you know, there's like 251 NGOs in this, in this NGO directory. Uh, and some people ask, why don't you just make it 250? And the, the answer, I, I, re I, I discovered that 250 is, uh, doesn't sound good in Chinese. It's basically a, a kind of a Chinese uh, slur for like, you know, you're kind of slow and, and stupid. And so they said, yeah, you, should, you can't use 250. So, okay, we'll use 251. Um, but 251 is really all we got. We actually had a list. Our target was 300. Uh, and there were, <laughs> there must have been, I think, 50 NGOs that we just could not get a hold of. They just didn't return our calls. You know, we tried to contact them for over for like a year. They never got back to us. So we did come up with 251, which I felt was a real achievement, um, given the time we spent. But j just to give you some sense, this 251 NGOs is really a very small segment of the entire NGO sector in China. If you if you define NGOs very broadly, so. Just to give you a sense, I mean, we have here the big circle are like the government NGOs, the, the gongos. And according to some 2005 estimates, there's about 6.7 million of those. Now, why, do you, why are there so many? I mean, that's because gongos are allowed to have a national network. So you're including not just the national level gongo, you're including its provincial level counterpart, its county level counterparts, you know, like the Women's Federation. So there's a lot of, of these gongos, if you include those local uh, branches. Then there's also a smaller group of registered NGOs. These are NGOs that are registered legally with the Civil Affairs Bureau. There's a, a, in 2005, there was 320,000 of those. Now there's about 450,000 of these legally registered NGOs. Um, there's three categories of these NGOs. There's social uh, organizations, there's civil non-enterprise units, and there's foundations. 
And then on the right, there's unregistered NGOs. These are NGOs that are registered as businesses or they're attached to some other organization. The Chinese, we call them guacal. Okay. They have attached themselves to like a university research institute uh, or a law school or a, another gongo or um, even a company. Um, so we don't know how many of, their, of these NGOs there are. There's really uh, no estimate. Oh, I should add that this, this category also includes these small community groups. So these are groups like uh, they organize like singing performances, dancing in communities, uh, you know, uh, tai chi, uh, these kinds of groups as well. Uh, virtual groups, student clubs are also included in this category. So again, no one knows how many because they're unregistered, but some people estimate a million or more. Uh, and then some scholars would also include rural associations. These are technical associations that form to uh, share uh, farming knowledge, you know, technical, uh, mm, like uh, how to grow livestock and, and so forth. So there's about, I don't know, there's more than a million of those. And then there's also another category called self-governing organizations, which include village committees and neighborhood committees at the local, at the very grassroots level. And there's about 700,000 of those. So that black dot there, that's where <laughs> our 251 are situated. They're a mix of the registered and the unregistered NGOs. So let me just share with you what we found from our data. What we, we, we went in, after collecting all the uh, information from these 251 NGOs, we, we analyzed the data that they provided us. And the data is summarized in the, um, in the report. There's a, there's a report that's a, a part of that uh, directory. It's also available online if you want. You can download it. But uh, what we did is we looked at, first of all, the regional distribution of these NGOs. You know, where are NGOs in China? Where are these grassroots NGOs concentrated? And you can see here that um, a, the large major a majority of them, or a large part of them, are concentrated in coastal areas, large cities, Beijing being one of them. Beijing, there's like 71 out of the 251. The East Coast, Jiangsu, Shanghai, Zhejiang, Guangdong. There's also another concentration like in the southwest, Sichuan, Yunnan, and Shanxi. Um, some areas are like, there, there's like a, um, you know, a, a shortage of these NGOs or that we didn't find that many. There's like Northeast China, Central China, there's not that many. Uh, and you'll also notice that in the ethnic minority areas in uh, Tibet, in Mongolia, and Xinjiang, we didn't have any NGOs. Um, and that doesn't mean there aren't any. It just means that um, we couldn't find them or they didn't want to be put in the directory. Uh, in terms of the sectoral distribution, I mean, there's um, a wide, again, a wide range of sectors that these NGOs work in. Uh, first and foremost was the environment. Probably no surprise there, given that the environmental sector is one where it's, where it's easier to work in. Education as well, um, and then disabilities, community development, migrant workers, women, and then further to the right, there were other categories that I couldn't fit in here uh, that would be like maybe legal aid, LGBT, you know, these kinds of areas. Uh, this is interesting. What we found that um, in looking at, we asked the NGOs when were they established, and you can see here that the majority, over 80% of the NGOs in our directory were established after 2000. So these NGOs, these grassroots NGOs are really quite new. They're very young. Um, very few were established before 1990 or in the, in the 1990s. Um, registration status. How are these NGOs registered? Uh, you know, a number, uh, we know that there are difficulties in trying to register as an NGO uh, because you're required to get a government sponsor uh, in order to register with civil affairs. So there are two legally uh, there are two legal categories of NGOs in our directory: uh, social associations and the, the civil non-enterprise units. We didn't include foundations. There's no foundations in this uh, this directory because there's already 
there's already a good database of uh, foundations in the China Foundation Center's uh, database. But uh, if you look at the first two categories, you can see that registered NGOs in our directory make up a good percentage. They make up over 60%. So that's interesting because originally we had thought that uh, many or fewer would be actually registered. But we're finding that actually uh, many of them were registered, and this may be because we have identified some of the more established, uh, well-known NGOs. There's been another sample that was uh, another analysis that was carried out by um, a Chinese University of Hong Kong professor uh, named Anthony Spires, and he uh, his fo his sample was also grassroots NGOs, and they found that only about uh, 30, 35 percent were registered in his sample. Um, and that's because their sample contained a, lot, uh, a, a number of smaller NGOs. Uh, in this sample here, you can see that 25% were registered as businesses, 7.6% were not registered, and 4.4% were uh, um, other, which meant, probably meant that they were, ta they were attached to some other organization. All right, so you know, that's an interesting look at the, uh, the registration status. And I think this shows that, again, the registration is becoming a little bit easier and more desirable for NGOs, and therefore more are are beginning to register. Oh, CNEU is like a civil non-enterprise unit. It's like, um, so the first category, um, the first category is, um, oops, is social, social associations are like membership associations. Like a lot of the trade associations or professional associations are the first category. It's very difficult to register as this because, um, the requirements are, 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 are greater, and the government is more concerned about organizations, you know, about membership organizations because of their influence. Um, CNEUs are kind of like uh, service providing or, you know, organizations, private, you know, schools and, and clinics and these kinds of things. Um, a number of environmental ones are, are registered as like CNEUs. Um, and um, the most famous one is Friends of Nature. Is was a, it wasn't registered for until like two years ago, but now it's registered as a CNEU. Yeah, the registration is really it's very complicated, and uh, you know uh, people tell you all kinds of stories about you know trying to get registered, and uh, it's um, it, it continues to be you know a big a big issue. I, t I said how I talked about how you know a lot of these NGOs were uh, were young. They've been established in the last ten years, and this gives you some other sense that the stat the, the capacity of these NGOs are, is really quite limited, very small. I mean, so you know if you look at the average the, the number of staff, most of these NGOs uh, you can see have like one to ten staff, under ten staff. It's also true of our NGO as well. Um, there are a few NGOs that are becoming quite sizable, though. If you look all the way to the right, you can see that about 20 of the NGOs in our directory have more than 30 staff. But again, if you compare this with like international NGOs, um, you know, uh, Chinese NGOs uh, just don't have, just don't compare. I mean, I asked my, um, I asked my friend who was heading the, uh, the World Wildlife Founda Federation in, in China, I asked him, how many, how many staff do you have? And he says, we have about 150 in China. So. That's just you know the World Wildlife Federation. Federation. Um, same thing with the budget. Their budgets are really quite limited. Uh, you can see most NGOs have an annual budget of under a million. Remi this is renminbi. So a million renminbi. What? Um, that's uh, um, about less than two hundred thousand. Uh, about seventy NGOs didn't respond for for obvious reasons. I guess you know they didn't want us to know their budget, or did they didn't want it to be publicized. Uh, again, you can see there are some NGOs, you know, about over 20 that have a fairly sizable budget of more than 3 million renminbi. Again, um, which is about 500,000 around there, US dollars. But again, as comparison, the World Wildlife Federation's budget just for the China office was 15 million US dollars. <laughs> so again, you know, these, these NGOs are, um, have uh, limited capacity. And again, that may be because they're, they're so young. We also were interested in like who funds these NGOs, who supports grassroots NGOs in China. Um, and so here's the response that we got. 
And they add, somebody asked, why do they add up to more than 100%? And that's because, of course, every NGO has more than one source of funding. They, can, they have s multiple sources of funding. But 41% of the NGOs said they received funding from Chinese foundations. 59% said they received funding from international foundations or NGOs. 14% from Chinese companies. Uh, about 17% from international companies. 20.7% uh, from foreign governments, like embassies, 21% from the Chinese government. So this is interesting for us because we have always thought that Chinese grassroots NGOs have relied very heavily on international funding. And I think you can see from this list that that continues to be the case. International funding continues to be very important to, um, to grassroots NGOs. Um, so, you know, there was somebody who wrote an article one of my um, friends who, who leads an NGO wrote an article about how why international funding has to increase rather than decrease for grassroots NGOs. Because they, you know, there's a lot of, um, in China, to try to get funding for some of the work that we do, it's very difficult because of sensitivity concerns. Um, but we also realize that more international organizations, more foundations overseas are getting pressured by their own, you know, constituents saying, why are you giving money to China? You know, why, why are you giving assistance money to China? China's becoming you know, a middle-class country. You know, they don't need any more help from, from us. Um, but my friend was trying to make the case that we do. I mean, grassroots NGOs continue to rely and do need that kind of support from the international community. Um, but at the same time, what we're seeing is a diversification of that funding stream. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. It's a good trend that more Chinese foundations are funding NGOs, and that um, Chinese companies are funding NGOs, and even the Chinese government is beginning to fund NGOs. The Chinese government this year started uh, a 200 million renminbi fund to outsource social services to NGOs. Uh, so we're waiting to see if that really means grassroots NGOs or does it mean gongos? What does it mean? So you know, but again, we're seeing a, a, a very fluid situation here. So let me just also, let me talk about now the second part of this. The second part is, is the diversification of public advocacy in China. And the reason we wrote this report, we did this report in about four months uh, over the last, from uh, November of last year to about uh, February of, of this year. And we, d we wrote this report because we wanted to see how much advocacy has changed since our last report on NGO advocacy in 2006. So here's what we found. We found, just to compare, the baseline was 2006. So our findings from the 2006 report were as follows. That we saw that many NGOs kind of saw themselves in this kind of uh, assistant uh, role, just assisting or collaborating with, rather than criticizing, government and business. Um, and we also found that few NGOs really expressed any concern about the business or the private sector, about their behavior. Also, a lot of NGOs raise, said raising awareness was really the most important goal for them in terms of advocacy. Uh, twice as many said that as said improving government policy or trying to influence government policy. Few NGOs during this time also had a communication strategy, really th well thought out communication strategy. So in short, what we're finding is in 2006, the space for public advocacy was really very restricted. Uh, the best known cases occurred in the environmental sector. Uh, like the New Zhang Dam uh, Dam case of 2004, where a number of environmental NGOs worked together with academics, with media, and with some government officials to uh, criticize the proposed series of dams along the New Zhang the New River, uh, and that resulted in 2004 in Premier Wen Jiabao suspending that dam project. But that was kind of a uh, exception. You know, it was like uh, that was one of the few and far between sort of advocacy cases that we saw during the mid-2000s. What did we find this time? We found that, we've, that more NGOs are adopting a kind of rights-based perspective when carrying out public advocacy. In other words, there it's, it's, um, advocacy is not just about raising awareness, it's about trying to change the power structure. And how do you do that? Right? By influencing government policy, by influencing the policy or the behavior of enterprises. Um, 
NGOs are also not just collaborating with the business sector, but they're also adopting a more kind of supervisory, a more critical uh, advocacy-based approach toward business. There's more advocacy NGOs and networks that have emerged that emphasize public participation and policy change. And the actors that are participating in advocacy are becoming a lot more diverse. We've got not just NGOs, we've got foundations, we have entrepreneurs that are sort of making their voice heard, uh, celebrities, media, and individual citizens. And we're also seeing that advocacy methods, the, the kinds of methods that are used have become quite diverse. And I'll talk a little bit about those networks, social media, impact litigation, performance art, petitions, social movements. So let me just kind of give you some idea that that before I, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure that facilitates public advocacy. You know, what makes this, uh, this uh, growth and diversification of public advocacy possible? And um, some of our findings were as follows, that the, the changes in the legal system have, um, have made it possible to do more of this advocacy, uh, advocacy through the legal system, through lawsuits. Uh, and then I just put in some of, the, uh, some of the laws that have been put in place over the last two decades that are mentioned in this advocacy report like um, the administrative procedure law, which allows, which allows people to sue the government. Um, and regulations uh, requiring disclosure of government information. So uh, this suggests that these efforts to sort of build the rule of law in China have had some kind of effect. The problem, of course, is that on the demand side, you still have, you need people, you need organizations to use the law to protect their rights, and that's just beginning to happen. Um, we're also finding that there's a more mature, a more networked civil society, and I just listed a number of the networks that we know about. Um, a number of them are environmental, like the China Environmental Advocacy Network and the Green Choice Alliance, but others are concerned with gender, women issues. Uh, GCAP China is concerned with a wide range of issues more relating to poverty relief, but they're also interested in advocacy and trying to train organizations in doing advocacy. And then there's also other networks that are involved with climate change, HIV AIDS, disabilities, anti-discrimination. So we're seeing, again, a more networked uh, society. We're also seeing on sort of, you know, cultural and social changes in Chinese society, a growing awareness of citizen rights and responsibilities, and the growth of social media. And um, I think a number of people have heard about that, the, the rise of the blogosphere. And this really has been uh, a really valuable instrument for, for many individuals and NGOs in trying to get the word out and, and also in networking with other individuals, other activists, and other NGOs. And that's had an impact on the mainstream media, because the mainstream media is now being pushed by social media to report on these kinds of changes, because otherwise then they feel like they've sort of fallen behind. They're not keeping up with you know, what's, what's going on. So that's also had an impact on how mainstream media reports the news as well. And they've been following more of these kinds of advocacy and uh, NGO uh, activities. So I just want to talk about, highlight some cases here. Uh, exhibit one, so NGO advocacy networks, and one of the best known of these is the Green Choice Alliance, which was established by Ma Jun, who's the founder of the Institute of Public Environmental Affairs. Uh, some of you may have heard of Ma Jun. He has this um, pollution, water pollution and air pollution map. Uh, and he put together uh, a network of NGOs, in environmental NGOs in different parts of China to monitor enterprise behavior and monitor um, their emissions their into the water emissions, the air emissions. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea of some of the things that they do, they put out some of these reports. One is uh, on monitoring heavy metal pollution in the, uh, like the IT industry. Uh, another one that got a lot of attention was this uh, corporate supply chain report uh, on Apple. So Apple, in, uh, they outsource a lot of their, the production of the parts of the iPhone, the iPad, to, uh, 
to factories and uh, companies like you know Foxconn, but they were. This is a report about the um, the environmental impact of that supply chain, and uh, I think you know that. Uh, has been getting a lot of news. Uh, I think last year got a lot of media attention, uh, not just for the environmental practices, but also for the labor practices in these uh, in these supply chain. Well, I mean, I think it's still ongoing, you know. And uh, but I think a Apple is big. I mean, from what I can see, Apple seems to be making some changes uh, because of the pressure that's being put on. Oh yeah, the, the heavy metal pollution. That's um, there's there there's an interesting um, public there's a p interesting lawsuit that's being lodged right now in Yunnan province. Yeah, about that. Um, but we haven't heard if it's been accepted by the courts yet. Exhibit two: social media and micro public interest action. So this is like a new term, right? Micro public interest. It's like Pursuing public interest through like microblogging, um, and so one of the cases of this is by Yu Jianrong. You know, Yu Jianrong is like a, a scholar at the Academy of Social Sciences, and he used microblog to raise awareness about child beggars and how a number of these child beggars uh, have been kidnapped, and so raising the the issue of of child trafficking and the use of these child uh, those, these children uh, as beggars. Uh, and he's asking people to identify these children through microblogs by photographing them and putting them on, uh, on the microblog. And the police also caught on to this and have been working, you know, in conjunction with this to, uh, to try to put a stop to, to child trafficking. So that has gotten a lot of attention. Um, here's another interesting case of social media. Uh, this is the I will test the air quality for the homeland <laughs> uh, campaign, uh, which is in 2001. So. I mean, those of you who have lived in China and Beijing, especially, know the uh, the environmental the, the quality of the air. Um, but for a long time, there was a big discrepancy between the U.S. embassy reading and the Chinese government reading, the environmental protection, the Ministry of Environmental Protection reading, because the Ministry of Environmental Protection did not include PM 2.5, which is uh, which are smaller particulates that uh, people think are more damaging to uh, the lungs in, in the long term. Um, so. A number of people, Chinese citizens, bloggers, caught on to this, and they started this campaign to say, "Look, you know, why don't we include PM 2.5 into our air quality monitor so there's like less discrepancy between the two?" So, this is a campaign that was launched by Feng Yongfeng of uh, Green Beagle Environmental Institute. Feng Yongfeng is an interesting guy. He's um, uh, he's a Guang, he's a reporter for the Guangming Rebal, uh, and he he's also the the founder of this uh, environmental uh, NGO, and he also started another NGO called uh, Nature University. So he basically raised money online through microblogs for these air quality monitors, and then he get, put them in the hands of volunteers around the country to monitor the air and raise awareness about this issue. And all this uh, sort of microblog, this blogging activity, I mean, r it's hard to say whether it had a direct impact, but. Uh, this is 2011 and 2012. The Chinese government decided to incorporate the PM 2.5 into their air quality um, indicator. So that's just another um, example of social media and the impact that can have in advocacy. Uh, exhibit three: impact litigation, the use of lawsuits, high visibility lawsuits to get people's attention, raise their awareness, and and to try to force changes within the law and uh, within policy. And this is uh, just one case, the 2009 Deng Yujiao case. She was a, uh, a woman who was assaulted, sexually assaulted by a, a local official. She ended up stabbing him and killing him, uh, and she got a very stiff jail sentence. And then there was this big uproar on the social media um, channels. And as a result, they, uh, they commuted her sentence, they lessened it. Uh, and so, but it, it raised the whole question of, of sexual harassment uh, and how women are treated in China. And a number of women's organizations latched onto this to raise awareness about this issue. Um, there's also been some interesting efforts at combining kind of impact litigation and performance art. So there's some organizations that are suing government agencies for discriminating against uh, like potential employees who apply for jobs in government agencies or in schools. 
and they're being asked, they're, they're being tested for hepatitis B or HIV AIDS, and if they're found testing positive, which is the case with many Chinese, because a lot of Chinese have hepatitis B, then they're rejected. But by law, they're not supposed to be. They're not supposed to be rejected for hepatitis. They're not, in fact, supposed to be tested. Um, so there's been a number of lawsuits that have been filed to, again, try to change uh, the behavior of government agencies. And this is a guy, he's doing some performance art. He's sitting on a toilet and said, uh, please don't, uh, uh, don't let the regulations that prohibit this kind of testing be used as toilet paper in other ways. You know, please don't let these be useless regulations. You know, let them have some teeth to it. Um, similar kinds of activities occurring with uh, HIV, with, with AIDS discrimination. So here's a campaign to so that they put these plaques in the hands of like well-known people like, um, you know, Ambassador uh, Gary Locke uh, saying that the, uh, in U.S. government organizations um, that HIV AIDS carriers will have equal access to employment. And again, to try to raise awareness that, you know, even people with AIDS should have equal access to employment, and they do in other countries. This is uh, another activity that is organized by Shenzhen, a labor organization in Shenzhen called Hand in Hand. And they organize this walk for the rights of women workers. So this is all men workers, and I don't know, can you see anything unusual about this particular activity? This is a walk they're taking through the park. Now you know that organized activities are usually, you know, very, it's very difficult to get permission for organized activities, so what people will do is they'll just take a walk to the park, uh, you know, a stroll. But can you see what's unusual about this? They're wearing high heels, yeah. The men are really wearing, they're all wearing like red high heel shoes. And, uh, you know, again, they're trying to give support to, to their women workers and, uh, again, raising awareness about uh, domestic violence and, and sexual harassment uh, in the workplace. So, again, this is just kind of one of the ways that these organizations, think, you know, kind of creatively think of trying to get around the, um, some of the restrictions on organizing. Uh, exhibit four. A number of new social movements regarding uh, sort of uh, on I environmental protests, uh, and there's been I think were like three or four of these that happened last year. Uh, this is one that occurred in Qidong in Jiangsu Province. There was another one in Ningbo, another one in Shifang in Sichuan. You're seeing more and more of these local environmental protests, sort of more NIMBY type, you know, protests, uh, not in my backyard protests. But uh, and then I think I heard about one that was just that just occurred. Um, in Guangdong, they were protesting the building of a uranium, uh, uranium plant. And uh, in a number of these protests, they have been successful in at least getting local officials to suspend the project or even cancel the project. Uh, one of the earliest ones was in Xiamen, I think, a number of years ago, which resulted in the Xiamen government you know, basically canceling that project. But of course, what happens in these NIMBY projects is that then they get moved somewhere else, right? So they, yeah, they cancel it in Xiamen, but then they're going to build it again. Uh, they'll build a plant in, in, um, in Zhangzhou, which is just, just down to the south of Xiamen. Um, performance art, I mean, it's kind of, a, I, I'm just kind of bringing back performance art just because there's some interesting cases of this. And a, a lot of these slides I'm using from people who presented at our, uh, our forum. So we asked a number of these people who had participated in this to, uh, to give presentations in our civil society forum in March. So I'm using some of their original slides. So, um, but you know, these are kinds of, performance art is an interesting way to, to get, attract attention, get, the, get uh, raise awareness and get the word out and maybe try to put some pressure on government officials because it doesn't involve too many people uh, and it, you know, catches the, uh, catches the eye, it gets, people gets people's attention. So this is um, a performance art uh, activity where they're sending pairs to government offices. And this is a uh, this is um, a Henan student who was who was taking the exam for college, um, and she's trying to advocate. She's trying to tell government officials to make the the college entrance exams uh, more equal. This is all about equal access to education because in Henan, because there's so many more people than, like, say, Beijing, uh, the the test score that you get to get to uh, college in Beijing has to be quite a bit higher than a test score of a Beijing resident. 
So she's saying that's unfair, it's unequal, and so she's trying to call attention to that. But why would giving pairs, I mean, why, 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 any idea what the symbolic importance of giving pairs is? I mean, there's, it's actually on that, on that sign. The, the, the kind of pair that she's giving them is called, uh, is uh, yali. And so it's kind of a play on words that she's yali, right? Yali means pressure. Yali is pair, right? So she's, she's sending pairs as a way to put pressure on government officials. Um, so they did this with a number of different cases, a number of different government organizations. Here's, here's another guy sending pairs, again, to another local government agency. This is, um, oh, Lei Chuang is one of the guys who's been very active in performance art, and he, um, He's a young university student, <laughs> and he gave this really interesting presentation at our civil society forum. So he, um, he shaved his head. This is a performance called, um, I want to invite the premier to dinner. Uh, and he said, you know, after graduating from college, one of the few things he could do was write. He knew how to write letters. So he started writing letters to addressed to Premier Wen Jiabao. So this is, and he shaved his head, you know, the, the same day he started writing. So this is like 38 letters. He's written 38 letters, and you can see that his, you know, the hair hasn't started growing back yet. Here the hair is starting to grow back. He's already reached, he's uh, he already sent out 100 letters, um, ask, inviting the premier to, to dinner or to eat. <coughs> Here's, uh, he, here he is at 200 letters, 300 letters. He says, you know, that's all he knows how to do, just... He just kept writing, Four, 400 <laughs> letters, 495, and his hair is getting pretty long here, 585. So then at this point, he got a letter back from the central petition office saying, do not send us any more letters. So what does he do? He kept writing letters. He says, that's the only thing I know how to do. So he, this is up at 713. Um, by this time, Premier Wen Jiabao had stepped down as premier because <laughs> they had a, a leadership transition. Uh, and a new premier came in, who was uh, Li Keqiang. But he said, again, having dinner with the premier is not the goal. Uh, victory was just in the process of doing this. To, oh, that's a very good question. I forgot to mention that. This is to, um, to tell them about uh, the problem with um, discriminating against hepatitis B carriers uh, who are applying for jobs. Yeah, so Lei Chuang, yeah, this is important. Lei Chuang is a hepatitis B carrier. He has hepatitis B, so he wants to bring attention to this issue. So when Premier Li Keqiang came to power, he kept writing letters to <laughs> Li Keqiang. And he said, you know, just keep smiling and, and keep writing letters. That's all, that's all he can do at this point to, uh, to bring attention to this issue. So anyway, let me just stop here, and I'll just kind of sum up what I've been saying. Um, that, you know, I think both the role of civil society and of advocacy have an important role to play in promoting good governance and a harmonious society. Um, I think good governance requires that, you know, citizens be able to participate in public decisions to protect their interests and their rights and to hold government and business accountable. The problem with governance in China these days is that it's too vertical. It's, it's too much top down. There's not enough, again, participation. There's not enough horizontal um, governance. And so this is what I think civil society and uh, advocacy organizations are trying to do. Uh, they're trying to play a small, and they are, they're playing a small but growing role in ensuring that citizens are heard in an orderly manner and thereby contributing to good governance and a harmonious society. And this is what they want, this is the message they want to send, is that we're not trying to create disorder. You know, we are really trying to create more channels for orderly participation, I mean, and that's what China needs more of, uh, especially in the long term. Um, but I think we also have to remember that civil society, these activities take place in a political space that remains constrained. I mean, there hasn't been that many changes in China's political system and probably will not be in the foreseeable future. Um, so in this context, grassroots NGOs and other citizen advocates, they have to be careful and they have to be strategic about carrying out their work. And 
I think this is another message that I'd like to, you know you to take away is you know and I think uh, Ambassador Roy alluded to this when he said in China you have a different way of doing things right so this is like civil society and advocacy with Chinese characteristics if you will um, that in order to be sustainable in order not to get closed down um, in order not to be visited by you know the state security or public security people we have to find ways creative ways uh, to engage in advocacy and there are I think you know I think I've, I've shown the space for advocacy has grown but again you know, we have to be careful about it we have to we can do it in sectors where it's permissible we can do it in ways that are permissible through performance art uh, through framing our language so that it sort of resonates with official language using terms like harmonious society um, and um, and also just you know being uh, conscious of what the what the limits of um, permissible uh, advocacy is but I do want to let you I did want to let you know about about these changes because I I think they're important and it's an important change that we've noticed in uh, in the role of civil society organizations in China. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop there and take questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cher, for that fascinating presentation. We have about 30 minutes. Uh, I would ask you to keep your questions short because there may be quite a few questions, and please identify yourselves. Let me start here. There's a, a new uh, policy emphasis on urbanization mm. and, and particularly looking for uh, uh, humanized urbanization or humanitarian urbanization in China. How do you see that affecting the development of civil society and the rule of law in China? Right, yeah. Could you identify <coughs> yourself, please? Yeah. Michael Replogel. I'm uh, Managing Director for Policy and Founder of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Right. Well, transportation comes to, you know, comes right to mind. Yeah. Um, no, that's a that's a great question. I mean, urbanization is, of course, you know, on the top of the list of the, the priorities of uh, the Chinese government, um, and urbanization, you know, is going to bring uh, a lot of changes. I mean, just looking at the process by which urbanization is going to be carried out. A lot of it will be a, a very top-down process. Um, hopefully, NGOs can have a, a say in um, in how this process will be carried out, and uh, they will also have an important role to play. I think in terms of uh, trying to fill in the gaps where, again, people fall through the cracks. Uh, in this urbanization, you know, process, uh, you know, relo relocating these people and, um, you know, finding them um, sources of employment, uh, and, you know, again, just making them feel welcome in their communities. I think these are all, you know, place a role. These are all places where I think NGOs can can play a role. But in terms of the broad policy, um, you know, I think that. There may not be much of a much influence that they can they can exert, but it does mean that there will be a more important role for NGOs because most of these NGOs are again located in in urban areas. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Ryan Wei with the State Department. Um, I was wondering if there was a degree of regional variation with how uh, local governments deal with civil society organizations, so even setting aside sensitive areas like, say, Tibet. Does Guangdong right. deal with it differently than Fujian, and do you see different <coughs> local governments developing different approaches to civil society? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, again, a uh, good question. I mean, there are regional patterns, um, regional models, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, that Guangdong has probably been on the forefront of civil society development. Uh, they have, like every year, they hold a, a like a, um, they don't call it civil society. They, uh, it's a, they use the word charity or ph 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 uh, philanthropy fair. Um, 
which is a major fair that brings together a lot of NGOs uh, from around the country. And they've developed regulations that are more conducive. Uh, they have lowered the barriers for registration and maybe possibly fundraising. So we are seeing that the sort of the more the most liberal area may be a most open area may be Guangdong. Uh, Beijing, what we've seen uh, is that the government has been more cautious. I mean, and maybe that's not surprising given that the, the, the political center. But uh, at the same time, there's a, I think most of the advocacy organizations that I've talked about are based in Beijing. So it creates an interesting mix. So I think there's um, a sense in Beijing that uh, life is not that easy uh, in Beijing. And partly it's because of the organizations that are there and partly because of the attitude of the, uh, the, the city government uh, and perhaps the, the central government. In Shanghai, they have um, another model where the government has very been very proactive in creating platforms uh, for nonprofits uh, and supporting them. But what we've seen is a lot of these are like more service uh, provision uh, organizations. They're not like advocacy organizations. Uh, so these are organizations that are going into communities and working with elderly, working with people with disabilities, working with children. Um, so they're a very different kind of model, very different set of NGOs in Shanghai than exist in, in Beijing. Um, so, you know, yeah, you're seeing some, you know, some really interesting uh, regional variations here. Um, but again, you know, it goes back to, or they're all mostly in, in cities. Uh, and again, cities is where, I mean, that's not to say that that's where all the problems are, but again, the problems of urbanization, I think, are there's such a wide range of things that are coming about because a wide range of problems that are coming about as people move into the cities that NGOs find that there's plenty of spaces where they can, they, they, there's, there's a need for them and there's the work that they can do. Did you have a question? <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Mm. I'm Eric McVeigh in the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. I've been asked several times in recent years to speak to a uh, Chinese NGO on energy security. Mm. They promote energy development and advocate uh, green energy and, uh, and well, clean energy and renewable energy and so forth. Uh, they, I guess, to protect some sort of UN mm. attachment that they have, adamantly deny that they get any government funding. Mm -hmm. But then when asked, they say that a single entrepreneur provides all the funding. Well, of course, that uh, raises for me and I think a lot of other people the question of, well, just how balanced will their views be? Aren't they just promoting his interest, whoever he, may, he or she may be? Is that unusual in China for them to, among other things, mm -hmm. then obscure who the, uh, where the funds come from um, and it, yet somehow not realize that that calls into doubt uh, the balance of their advocacy. Right, right. Yeah, no, good question. I mean, <coughs> it's, uh, you know, the whole issue of, of transparency is certainly a, a problem in China. And this is one reason why we created this directory, is to try to make the set of NGOs, you know, again, more transparent. But there are, of course, other NGOs, and maybe this is, you know, there this NGO is one of the ones that, uh, that you, you, you talked about that maybe uh, where it's not easy to know what kind of what their background is. Um, so to say that they don't get government funding does not mean they that they don't have close relations with you know the government. I mean it's it's um, when we say in Chinese we say that these organizations have government background. We don't say that they're necessarily run by the government. Um, so that means that they could have. Uh, the, the, the director of that NGO could be a former government official that then retired and was sent over from their agency. Uh, <clears throat> but um, in this case, I would definitely, yeah, if it was just funded by one entrepreneur, that would raise a red flag for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would, I would ask some more questions. I mean, I, it would be, I don't, I don't know uh, anything about the, uh, this NGO. Is this, this is a Chinese NGO, right? Yeah, and I, you know, I'd look into you know who the entrepreneur was, but um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, that's right, right, right. I mean, I, I would feel more comfortable if it, was, if it was funded from some more, from other organizations that had a little bit more credibility, but yeah. I mean, you know, the thing about charity, and I mean, as I'm finding out, you know, run, I mean, help uh, working for China Development Brief and, and doing our own fundraising is that sometimes people fund you for the strangest reasons, you know, just because maybe you got, you know, the two, you, you met the, f the, the head of this, uh, you met the entrepreneur or the head of this uh, foundation, you guys hit it off and, and, and they want to fund you. And, uh, you know, it could be something as personal as that. Um, so I would definitely, yeah, be uh, wary of it. Okay, over I here. I also have a question about funding. M I'm Helen Raffel with Resources for the Future, and I taught environmental science for two years at Sichuan University in Chengdu oh, okay. a few years ago. Uh, my question is, in your chart about the sources of funding, mm -hmm. you had, uh, a, you know, a good size portion coming from foreign governments. It wasn't insignificant. And I think you said that your own organization, your brief, mm -hmm. was initially funded, partly at least, by the uh, American, the U.S. Uh, uh, embassy. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, first of all, what types of <coughs> NGOs do foreign governments provide funding for? Is there a specific type? Yeah. And secondly, does it cast doubt on the activities of those NGOs, the fact that a foreign government is pushing for their activities? Right, right. Well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so I will come clean and say that, yeah, we, we're not just uh, funded by the U.S. Embassy, but also by uh, a German foundation which gets its money from the German government, um, as well as other you know foundations. But um, that we are always mindful when we apply for funding about where our funding comes from, because uh, outside funding, international funding, can be quite sensitive. Uh, from what I've been told, I mean, any most funding that comes from like, uh, I guess. Certain U.S. organizations are the most sensitive. The U.S. is like at the top of the list, right? The hit list, and then, yeah, the, <laughs> the or the blacklist or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then uh, European organizations tend to be safer. But uh, you know, if wh what kinds of NGOs are getting international funding? It's really mostly the these advocacy NGOs that I've been talking about. Advocacy for a range of different issues, environment, uh, education, uh, disabilities, civil society, uh, anti-discrimination, you know, there's um, a lot of the ones that do work that goes beyond like education, poverty relief. I mean, you know, the traditional chi idea of Chinese charity tends to focus on sectors like poverty relief, disaster relief, education, right? These are the kinds of things that uh, both government and government gongos tend to support. But if you do work outside of that, it's more difficult to get funding from the Chinese government. It's difficult to get funding from Chinese foundations. Uh, we've been working with, we've been approaching a number of foundations, Chinese foundations, to try to fund our work. But our work is viewed, again, I mean, we're kind of like a media organization. So they look at us and they say, well, you know, <laughs> um, we'd like to fund you and you do interesting work, but maybe come back, you know, next year and, and we'll see. Um, so, but when we approach foreign donors, it's a lot easier because they understand the work that we do. We they understand the importance of it. And that seems to be, that, that situation hasn't, hasn't changed. But at the same time, accepting foreign funding comes with its own problems because the um, yeah because the Chinese government is more concerned about foreign influence, and so that will always raise red flags, especially if you get funding from a certain set of organizations, uh, f uh, funders that I won't I won't mention here. But okay, um. anybody in the back of the uh, room? If not, uh, let's go here. No, uh, the, the lady back. 
Ah, Excuse thank me. you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Rorty. I'm a recent graduate of the Joseph Cobrell School for International Studies over in Denver. And I have also have a question kind of related to funding, but also related to uh, Xi Jinping's recent crackdown <laughs> on corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a lot of us China watchers, we know that uh, Xi Jinping has been uh, cracking down on things like um, corruption, but, um, ex but also extravagance, luxury items, large banquets, things like that. And... Um, you could see perhaps like there would be excess money where they're not exactly using it for these like luxury goods or you know for um, these large banquets. Additionally, in civil society, specifically uh, internet activism, you're seeing people uh, rail against government officials buying these luxury items, like the recent incident with like what was it, the Watch Brother with a thirty thousand <coughs> dollar watch and the, uh, that mm -hmm. conspicuous watch tan. So my question is, do you see this crackdown and like this increasing social pressure, perhaps? taking that money and maybe feeding NGOs, feeding funding into NGOs, and what could be like the dynamics of that later in the future? Is, you know, is today's watch brother tomorrow's NGO brother? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see, um, I don't know if, well, I, I assume most of this, uh, this corruption is taking place among officials. And I don't see officials being donors uh, for NGOs in the near future, uh, unless they come to some kind of uh, epiphany about civil society organizations. I think most most government officials don't seem. I mean, they're not maybe not very aware of the, the work that uh, the NGOs do, or if they do, they may not have a they they may not have a, a positive view necessarily of what um, of what we do. So, um, but. Certainly, the crackdown on corruption is attracting attention from civil society organizations and activists because, you know, it all ties into the question of transparency and government transparency, um, government and the need for oversight, and that's certainly a role that civil society should play, um, given the immense amount of money that is going through the system. So. Um, it is an issue, and it's a it's an issue that you know is being um, is being watched. But because it is coming from the very top, it's also an issue you have to be very careful to become involved in. Okay, and I'll come over here. Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. Uh, What's been the impact in your world, or the in effect in your world, of the arrest of this uh, lawyer, uh, legal advocate? Because I gather some of his work does get into into the kind of things that you're involved in. Yeah, I mean, I, you're talking about uh, Xu Zhiyong, or yeah. who's the um, yeah? He was the former founder of the Gongmeng, the constitutional. Uh, initiative and uh, he's been his uh, he was investigated before for uh, for tax issues. Is I, I assume that this is the person who was uh, th who was also right for again uh, you know trying to uh, <coughs> trying to raise awareness about the the need for officials to reveal their assets. Yeah, so this is something that's been uh, the other. It's not just him, but other. I mean, some lawyers and other activists have been also. Uh, detained and and arrested for, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think we know we know about we 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 uh, we're, we we know what's been going on, um, and I mean, we have not had much contact with him. But um, we, you know, it, I think it certainly it it means that we just have to be you know sort of more cautious. I mean, I think it uh, it sort of increases that the level of caution that we need to have when we carry out uh, activities and uh, it just again shows that the political environment right now is um, is still quite uncertain uh, and that's something that I've heard from a number of NGOs and uh, and activists that uh, this is uh, this is a time to again be I think maybe uh, a d you know more cautious and not to try anything um, that uh, might attract too much attention. Um, so I think right now we're in some, you know, kind of a waiting period. 
and um, we'll see what happens, you know, further down down the road. My name is Amy Nagabauer, and I'm from Ashoka. And my question relates to the NGO directory. Mm -hmm. and I'm curious, as you worked with a number of different NGOs, did you see, uh, or did you see any patterns as it related to the leaders, or drivers, or founders of the organizations? Um, do you have insights about what their background, inspiration, why do they do what they do? Um, and then, secondly, do you know of organizations or supporting entities that are really generating the next generation of such leaders? Um, yeah, that would be, that's a good question. I mean, that would be a really interesting thing to analyze the, uh, the directory for. Uh, we, d we just didn't have the capacity to do that, uh, but to, to look at the, the individuals and their, you know, their background. I mean, who, who are the people who are setting up this, uh, these, these organizations, and what's the difference between, like, you know, the first generation uh, the first generation, first generation um, leaders, and the second generation, and so forth. And so, all I can say is just like anecdotally. But anecdotally, I mean, we do see that. I think you s you do see. I mean, the first generation tended to be people from a variety of different uh, fields, but usually people who had done work in many different sectors. And um, and the second generation seems to come. They seem to be. I don't know. What the best term for the? I mean, more professional. They 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 usually come. They've you know usually worked in in one sector, and they're interested in transferring their skills. To, I mean, like they've been in business, or they've been working for the media. Um, a number of environmental organizations have been established by former journalists or current journalists. Um, but you know, they're interested in transferring their skills to the uh, the nonprofit NGO sector. Uh, you do see uh, you do see I think more emphasis on on um, on professionalism, I mean, by that I mean like uh, an emphasis on on building the organization. Uh, whereas the first generation, I think, you had these very charismatic individuals who have been kind of reluctant to hold to, to let go. Um, but you know, the reason they were so successful is because they were charismatic and they could work in multiple areas. They had they had connections in the government, they had connections in media, they had connections in, th in the academy and so forth. And that was what partly what made them successful, but it also made them kind of indispensable, you know. Uh, so, um, but, uh, and you know, there's still a, I mean, th there aren't any sort of NGO or nonprofit management programs. I mean, they're just, they're, they're just coming up at universities. So, there hasn't been the sort of opportunities to get that kind of training, that kind of education, unless you've gone overseas. Uh, but we also are seeing, yeah, some people coming back from study overseas and also setting up their own NGOs. And we're seeing um, also some, uh, some foreigners who are coming into China and setting up, uh, I don't know how to say it, Chinese NGOs. They're kind of localizing. You know, they're taking what they learn in the U.S., and setting up their own organizations and kind of registering it there as Chinese NGO, they hire Chinese staff, and then they localize it. So we're seeing that kind of pattern as well. Yes. Um, I'm Matthew Robertson. I write for the Epic Times. Um, I have a smorgasbord of questions, but just um, uh, one really, with two parts. Um, you didn't speak, could you talk a little about um, pongos and how they work, um, party <laughs> organized <laughs> NGOs? Are they the same as gongos? Um, <laughs> what's, their, um, what's their story? And also, um, perhaps they're called um, brotherhood, or brotherhood organizations or the xiong di hui and, um, and qing nian hui. How do these groups, I mean, they're not registered. I read about them a couple of months ago in um, um, Southern Weekend, and I'm just kind of curious what how how they operate or what their influence is um, at the local level. Hmm. Xiong di hui. Yeah. Okay. No, I haven't heard. This is the first time that I've heard that term. Um, so I mean, but uh, in terms of pongos, pongos and gongos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, let me just say that you know, there's like a diversity. I mean, as with any category, I mean, there's a lot of diversity within this category. But um, yeah, I mean, the party has also been interested in. Um, you know, there's this uh, this whole notion called social innovation and. The idea is to try is to encourage 
party organizations and government organizations to be more innovative in the way that they manage and incur and cultivate uh, nonprofits or NGOs, because the government realizes that yeah, it's begin it's it it can't do all the work that, uh, it can't provide all these services on its own that it has to outsource these services to to nonprofits. The problem is there's maybe not enough of these nonprofits. There are not enough that are c are capable of carrying out that work. So. They want to incubate and cultivate uh, these organizations, and they're creating platforms for that. So, um, so you have these pongos and 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 some of the gongos that are involved in creating these these platforms to incubate and to provide sort of support services for uh, for these NGOs. Um, and you know, I mean that that so. That's one way to look at them, and the other way to look at them is that, you know, that some more NGOs also see the pongos and gongos as a way for NGOs to be co-opted, as well. That you know, once you start receiving that kind of support, the, you'll be less likely to be critical of the government or of business. So, you know, I guess there's two ways to look at that sector, and right now the jury is, I guess, not out, but. I mean, you know, yeah, we are we are aware of this effort to create these kinds of platforms, um, but there's not. Again, it's very. It seems to be very decentralized. There's no. These efforts are not. They don't seem to be much coordination between them. It's you know different party and government organizations that seem to be doing this on their own initiative. Let's take back there and then. Hi, Erica Salm with the East West Center. Um, I just wanted to ask, you were saying a lot of the NGOs are based, you know, in big cities like Shanghai or Beijing. Huh. Um, and does their work, you know, I know the resources are very limited. Does their work outreach to some of the more rural mm -hmm. regions or are there budgetary and other constraints keeping them inside their city, thus leaving other regions of China left out? Yeah, of right. Yeah, good question. I mean, I didn't, you know, there are, there are, um, there are some organizations that are based in more rural areas, and there's, but of course, there's NGOs that are based out in um, Sichuan and Yunnan and Qinghai that are s servicing more rural communities. Um, but yeah, in terms of you know, in terms of regional impact, I mean, NGOs are limited because of the registration system. If you register in if you register in, in the Chaoyang district of Beijing, then your work can only be in the Chaoyang district of Beijing. And you can only, so, you know, it's very limited. Um, and it, it's very difficult to get, uh, to register as a national organization and therefore have national scope. But um, that doesn't, I mean, there's there are NGOs that get around that all the time. They just don't say what their, you know, they don't say what the scope of their projects are, or they register another organization in the area that they want to do work in. Um, so, um, so there, there is, you know, there, there is that effort to try to, I think, service different populations, but and to get break outside of those regional restrictions. Um, but yeah, my sense is that, um, you know, there are, there probably is a shortage. Definitely, I mean, there's a shortage of NGOs all, all around, but uh, a shortage of NGOs that are servicing, I think, more. Uh, are servicing rural areas. There is an effort by some people to create these kinds of rural cooperatives, uh, to create um, these cooperatives that provide, um, you know, that these are kind of, uh, they, they're trying to provide a sense of community in these rural areas, but um, also provide uh, ways for the that area to earn more income, to, to raise their, their income base. Um, but right now, that's just been at the experimental stage, these kinds of rural cooperatives. I'm talking about more comprehensive cooperatives. So before, what you've had is these technical cooperatives sort of formed to share technical farming knowledge. But these are efforts to try to um, tie into the community. And, um, but again, that's just being done at an experimental level from what I know. Uh, I'm Amanda Xiong from the Global Fund for Children. Um, I think we've spoken over the civil society listserv, so it's okay. good to meet you in person. Um, my question is around 
the government funding that the NGOs in your directory um, have received. And I was just wondering, first, whether that number that you counted was all central government funding or whether <laughs> it included local government, city government. Um, you know, it, it can look right. very different depending on what level of government you're talking about. Um, and then the second part of my question um, is, you know, with that 200 million renminbi fund that the central government has kind of set aside for NGO um, social services outs outsourcing, obviously there's a lot of pressure on the government to outsource social services, and there's also a lot of pressure from individual donors, as we've seen with the more recent Sichuan earthquake, to give and to have more giving options to more grassroots NGOs. Um, so I was just wondering what you thought the temperature was and if there was any pressure at all on the government to give that out to more of these independent um, grassroots NGOs. And I will say we have had two grantees that have, for the first time ever, gotten mm -hmm. money from the central government, which I think is an encouraging sign, but mm -hmm. just wondering if those pressures were there or what you felt about that. Hmm. Okay, um, yeah, good questions. Uh, what was the first, the first question was about whether uh, oh sorry <laughs> whether the <laughs> number the 21 percent of NGOs yeah, yeah, right is it just central it's or national or? and local yeah yeah so it, it's uh, it's all levels and yeah that th I should say that um, you know they have um, these these local governments have their own funds for uh, outsourcing services to to local NGOs and I think the uh, and you know you, you notice like I think if you in different parts of China they have this like s this thing called social welfare lottery so they had this lottery, and this lottery is to raise money for this kind of outsourcing of, of services. Um, but uh, what's the temperature? I mean, uh, right now, I think it's kind of lukewarm. I mean, um, I don't think there is that much pressure for the central government or local government to outsource services to grassroots NGOs. I think the question for them is not so much whether they're a gong or a grassroots. It's like the question is about the capability or whether these NGOs meet certain requirements. So to, you know, to, um, are they registered? <laughs> so that automatically excludes a number of grassroots NGOs that are not registered with civil affairs. So this, again, brings back the registration issue, you know. I mean, so let's try to lower the barriers for registration so that these NGOs can get into the system and apply for government funding. Um, so, you know, I think right now, my sense just reading the reports is that uh, governments tend to give money to, fa to organizations that they're more familiar with and that they trust, which sounds kind of intuitive, right? So, uh, but that tends to be usually the gongos rather than the grassroots organizations. I think there's still like this gap, you know, there's like a gap between grassroots and, and the government and there's a, a kind of lack of understanding, different cultures as well. Um, because grassroots organizations have their own set of values and so, and missions. So, um, so at this point, I don't. Yeah, I don't see there being that much pressure for, for that. But you know, we we'll see. I mean, if there if there are not enough qualified NGOs to receive that kind of um, outsourcing, then um, then hopefully, you know, that will drive uh, changes in the registration uh, laws. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but uh, thank you all for joining us, and please join me in thanking Dr. Shea. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, like I said, I'll be outside and manning the table. I'll be donning my salesman <laughs> hat there. All right. Yeah. No, no, they're not. <laughs>